Teresa, Amy, Christine, I think that we can start whenever you want. Thank you very much. Distinguished experts, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third webinar of 2024 of the ACTAD Informal Working Group on Consumer Protection in E-Commerce. I'm Teresa Moreira, the head of the Competition and Consumer Policies Branch of ACTAD, and I'm delighted to uh, open this third webinar today. We will be focusing on a critical issue that resonates deeply uh, in our interconnected world, the protection of vulnerable and disadvantaged consumers in digital markets. In an era where digital technologies are part of every aspect of our lives, the dynamics of consumer protection have evolved rapidly. While these advances bring unprecedented convenience and opportunities, they also present unique challenges, particularly for vulnerable consumers whose needs will require special attention. ANCTAD is the focal point on consumer protection issues within the United Nations system, and we are the guardians of the revised United Nations guidelines for consumer protection. The revised UN guidelines for consumer protection contains since it, the latest revision of 2015, a specific session on e-commerce, recommending that member states should work towards enhancing consumer confidence in e-commerce by the continued development of transparent and effective consumer protection policies, ensuring a level of protection that is not less than that afforded in other forms of commerce. Moreover, the guidelines advocate for the protection of consumers' privacy and data rights, emphasizing the importance of obtaining consent for consumers' data collection, ensuring its security, and giving consumers control over their personal information. This, even, this is even more essential for the protection of vulnerable and disadvantaged consumers. Vulnerable groups such as the elderly, children and young persons or those with limited digital literacy may be more susceptible to misleading and fraudulent practices and also to personal data exploitation. Additionally, disadvantaged consumers may lack the necessary resources to understand complex terms and conditions, and of course, to protect themselves from online scams. So to safeguard vulnerable and disadvantaged consumers uh, from exploitation and harm in an increasingly digital market, it is crucial to ensure robust online consumer protection and strict product safety measures. Furthermore, specific education and support programs empower these groups to safely navigate technology and effectively advocate for their rights as consumers. The guidelines also highlight the importance of promoting digital inclusion to ensure that all consumers can benefit from technological advancements. This includes addressing barriers such as affordability, literacy, and accessibility to ensure that often marginalized groups are not left behind in the digital age. According to data gathered by the International Telecommunications Union, the uh, United Nations agency specialized in electronic communications and postal services, global population without access to the internet steadily decreased to 2.6 billion people by 2023, representing 33% of the global population. Internet usage remains closely linked to the level of development of a country with higher income countries uh, nearing universality, boasting a 93% internet penetration rate. But in low-income countries, only 27% of the population uses the internet. It is also worth noting that disparities are very significant in terms of gender and age. So there is a gender gap in internet usage with 70% of men compared to 65% of women using the internet in 2023. Furthermore, there is a generational gap with young people aged between 15 and 24 years old being 14% more likely to use the internet than the rest of the population. This gap remains consistent across all regions, indicating a global trend in the digital divide between the youth and older demographic groups. 
So addressing gender and youth gaps requires not only providing equal access, but mostly providing education to foster a more inclusive and connected global society. This webinar, as I mentioned earlier, is being organized in the framework of the ANCTAD Informal Working Group on Consumer Protection in e-commerce. This working group was convened as requested by the ANCTAD Intergovernmental Group of Experts on Consumer Protection Meeting in 2017 to highlight best practices to facilitate information exchange and consultations. For the work program of this year, the working group decided to conduct three webinars and issue two technical notes before this year's meeting of the IG on Consumer Protection Law and Policy that will take place in Geneva on the 1st and 2nd of July, 2024. I take this opportunity to invite you all to save the date and join us for the seventh session of the IG on Consumer Protection. Previous working groups webinars held this year dealt with risks and benefits of artificial intelligence to consumers. You are still able to watch the videos that were recorded of these two very interesting and very widely attended webinars. And this information is being shown in the chat um, box. In closing, the importance of our discussion today cannot be overstated. As we delved into the critical issue of protecting vulnerable and disadvantaged consumers in digital markets, it becomes more evident that our efforts are crucial to shaping a fairer and more equitable digital landscape. ANCTAD remains committed to advocating for consumer rights and fostering inclusive digital markets. Together, let us navigate the complexities of digital commerce, ensuring that no consumer is left behind. In closing, I am very grateful again to all the distinguished experts that um, were able to uh, uh, join us sharing their experience. I would also like to thank uh, in advance participants for their presence and for, for possible questions. Uh, especially uh, thanks are, um, are due to the Swedish consumer agency colleagues for their efforts in organizing this webinar. Before I really close, I would like to um, uh, again thank Professor Christine Riefer for the coordination from a scientific and substantive point of view of the work of this informal working group of ANCTAD and my colleagues from the Secretariat, Elizabeth Gashuri and Valentina Rivas. I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa, for those um, very thought-provoking words. Um, my mission today is obviously to welcome everybody to the webinar and perhaps frame the conversation. So we are going to be discussing vulnerable consumers in digital markets, and we are um, effectively going to talk about consumer vulnerability. Consumer vulnerability, I think for me today, as my message will be that it should be thought of as the norm, not the exception. Vulnerability um, is a value that is um, protected by the UNGCP Article 5, as Theresa has already hinted. It's uh, an article on legitimate needs that the guidelines are intended to meet, and that includes protection of vulnerable and disadvantaged consumers. Within this remit, today focuses <coughs> on the challenges encountered by one particular category of vulnerable consumers, children. Thanks to our panel of speakers, expertly put together by our colleagues at the Swedish Consumer Authority, we will hear more about what needs to be done in that field. But I wanted to highlight that there are many other groups that can be considered vulnerable. We've already heard of some. Women who find themselves less able to access e-commerce, engage with it, and finally, when they're able to do so, very often find that for certain product, they are being discriminated against by having to pay more for the same goods than their male counterparts. But vulnerability is not just about a personal characteristics. It can also be based on socioeconomic grounds or have other underlying causes. 
Digital markets create asymmetries that place consumers in vulnerable situations and exacerbate already existing vulnerabilities. Badly developed systems of regulation or lack of access to justice can also create vulnerabilities for consumers. Vulnerability in consumer law is often associated with particular groups or particular characteristics of individuals. They are seen as the exception. But in digital markets, there is a need to reconsider this viewpoint, to shift expectations. Vulnerability should be understood as the norm rather than the exception. Technology has enabled many market actors to orient consumers' choices on such scale that consumers are most of the time, in fact, devoid of any agency or ability to truly choose. And it's with this in mind that I will now hand you over to Emmy Gustafsson, who has been um, the mastermind behind today's fantastic talks and leading us into exploring how children as a vulnerable groups are being protected in the digital world. Emmy, thank you very much. Over to you. Well, thank you, Christine. Uh, I don't know if I'm the mastermind, but there has been a, a lot of people contributing to this webinar. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Teresa and the ANCTA Secretariat for the opportunity to co-organize this webinar. Um, my name is Emmy Gustafsson. I work as a senior legal officer and policy advisor at the Swedish Consumer Agency, and I will be the moderator of today. I think we have great presentations ahead of us, uh, more precise three speakers uh, who will address protection of vulnerable consumers on digital markets from different angles. Uh, after the three presentations, we will have a Q&A session, so please save your questions until all the three presentations are finalized. Uh, at the end of the webinar, Christine and I will share our thoughts and some concluding remarks of what we've heard today. So the plan is to end the webinar at 15.30 today. We'll see if we manage. We're running a bit late now, but I think we'll manage. But it's time to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Eva van Reimerstahl, who is an associate professor at Amsterdam School of Communication Research at Amsterdam University. In her presentation, she will speak about how to disclose commercial content towards children by taking research on advertising literacy into account. She will also touch on subjects such as gamification, advert games. Please, Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for your introduction. Um, I will share my screen so you can see my presentation. Start at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, thank you for uh, for inviting me. Thank, thank you for uh, for having me in this uh, in this uh, session. I'm very honored to share uh, my my research with you, the insights that I've built in the uh, past years. Uh, I've been doing research on uh, sponsored content for almost uh, well, over 20 years at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and today I'll talk uh, about uh, the research that I and colleagues did on how we can inform children, uh, but also adolescents, so it's, it's minors in general, uh, about sponsored content online. And uh, with sponsored content, we mean uh, uh, commercial content or persuasive content that is hidden in, uh, for example, games or in posts of influencers. So it's not plain or um, uh, clear advertising, but it's content that is uh, presented as being an entertainment or, um, or, or games. Uh, by a different party than the advertiser uh, itself. Um, so, um, yeah, especially for these forms of advertising, uh, vulnerable groups and children in particular, 
are uh, at risk because it's hard to discern uh, commercial content when it's embedded into other content. And especially for children who do not have the uh, same levels of uh, advertising literacy, literacy as uh, adults do, um, it's very hard to be critical and to understand what's going on when they see uh, entertaining online content that is actually not only entertaining, but also um, there to persuade them. So today I um, want to discuss a couple of topics uh, like uh, Amy said on, on disclosures, but also on gamification. So I, first I would like to start uh, by uh, telling about the research that I've done, the insights that we've gained uh, in the uh, last years on how to effectively disclose online sponsored content to children, and that's uh, children and adolescents, so it's it's all, all minors. Um, I would also like to talk a bit about the consequences of disclosures. So um, not only what should disclosures look like, but also um, what can the consequences be? Can they enhance transparency of sponsored con content? Can they empower children to make better decisions, more informed decisions, but also what are the consequences for persuasion? Uh, and then I would also like to share some insights on the research that we did on gamification uh, of advertising and advert games in, uh, in specific. So first to start with how to disclose sponsored content for, for children. Well, uh, in this case, uh, um, we studied disclosures in the form of texts, uh, also sometimes pictograms, but uh, so you have to imagine text like hashtag ad or text that say this uh, content is brought to you by or this is sponsored. Can these texts uh, that identify content as being sponsored help children to understand, better understand what's going on online? Um, and uh, based on the, on, the, on the research and also on theory, um, I can see three principles that are important. Um, for effectively disclosing sponsored content online. And first of all, that's opportunity. So children need to get, have the opportunity to uh, uh, understand what's going on when something is advertising or not, when their favorite influencer is talking about advertising. So, and with opportunity, it's the opportunity to process the information or to understand the information. Um, so that has a lot to do with um, where the disclosure is placed, for example. Do they have a chance of seeing it? Are they giving the opportunity to truly inform them? And I'll come back to that uh, on, in, on the next slide. Another important principle is ability, and especially for children. We, if we want to effectively disclose sponsored content for children, uh, we have to take, it, take into account their abilities, their cognitive abilities, their um, uh, also social emotional abilities. Are they able to understand uh, that, that something is advertising based on what we are telling them? Uh, is this really transparent according to their abilities? I'll also discuss that more on the next slides. And the final principle is motivation. So we have opportunity, ability, and motivation. And that has to do with are the minors or the vulnerable groups. We can also extend this to other groups, but today I'll also talk, I'll only talk about children. But is there a certain level of motivation to be informed or to, to um, be critical? So I'd like to dive deeper into these three principles and uh, illustrate based on our research what are good disclosures for sponsored content for children that optimize their opportunity, ability, and motivation to be informed and to be empowered to deal with online sponsored content. So first of all, opportunity. Uh, and I think there are different opportunities. So first of all, there's an opportunity to see, the opportunity to see the information, to see the disclosure. Uh, if a child does not see the information, uh, it will not lead to increased, increased or enhanced transparency. So for the uh, disclosure to have the opportunity to be seen, 
Uh, our research shows that it needs to be placed prominently. That means in a, a big type size, for example, the big font uh, centrally on the screen. Uh, and for also, for example, before a video st starts. So you can imagine if a kid watches a YouTube video uh, from their favorite influencer who's very enthusiastic, showing toys, um, uh, presenting entertaining, fun, high-paced content, that the opportunity to see a disclosure is almost uh, zero. So if you can show a disclosure before a video start, it gives the child a better opportunity to see the disclosure, first step in effectively enhancing transparency. So this also means that what we still see online, that it should not be uh, done in the form of a hashtag, for example, that's hidden between other hashtags. There are a lot of hashtags and somewhere in there, there's hashtag ad. Uh, this does not enhance the opportunity to see the disclosure or the information to a, a sufficient level. Or what we also sometimes see, that the disclosure is somewhere in the video description. Well, we know from our research that on YouTube, children watch videos, but they don't uh, look at the description unless there is a specific call made by the influencer, for example, to check the description uh, because there is information that children can win something. Uh, but if it's somewhere, if it's just somewhere in the description, there's hardly any, any opportunity to see then it, it asks too much from a kid to go after that information. So there's also another opportunity. It's not only opportunity to see, um, but there's also opportunity to process. So to process the information cognitively processed and understand the information that's presented. And especially for children, this is a, an, an important issue that we need to take into account. So one thing that we have to realize is that um, the, 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 the disclosure needs to be, be displaced, displayed long enough for a child to be able to read it. Um, so if, if it's only hashtag ad, it's of course easier to read you. There's not a need to display it for a long time, but sometimes you also see a sentence like this is sponsored or this is paid advertising by, and then uh, the brand is mentioned that already requires more reading. And then if the disclosure disappears, you have to have a long enough, uh, exposure to, to be able to read, to have the opportunity to process it. Um, and this, of course, also depends on the level of uh, of liter literacy and also the, the the reading level of of a child. Um, so, in this sense, it, it means that the longer, the better. Um, and always, also like um, Theresa said in the beginning, uh, the um, vulnerability should be the norm. So, just um, take the the kid that can read the worst as the norm, and then other kids will also be able to, uh, to have the opportunity to process. Another opportunity for disclosing online commercial content that we ex explored was uh, designing pictograms. So really easy to understand intuitive um, uh, pictures, pictograms, um, uh, or icons that can identify sponsored content. So ideally, this would make it um, possible for, for anyone to just by seeing this icon immediately know that the, you are dealing with commercial content, sponsored content, um, and that it, it's advertising and not just entertainment. Well, we've done some studies uh, on developing pictograms. Uh, also in co-creation with children on what they thought it should look like and what associations they have with it. And we were able to develop some pictograms that have uh, these, that, that elicit these associations among children. But the only issue that we had and that we found out in research that is that pictograms are hardly looked at by children. So um, the opportunity to see was very low, uh, but that may also be uh, due to the way that pictograms are nowadays used in, for example, uh, content ratings. So if you see a pictogram of uh, harmful content or of uh, age restrictions, they are not that prominently placed. 
So uh, it could be if you place them more prominently, it can be a very good way, intuitive way for children to understand what's going on. So that brings me to the ability. So we had the opportunity to see and to process, but we also have to take into account the ability of children um, uh, to process uh, disclosures and to be effectively informed. Well, a very important thing that came out of our research, also research that we did uh, together with the Dutch Media Authority, is that you should use understandable wording for children. And this may sound logical or intuitively, um, yeah, yeah, logical. Um, but we found out that some words that we think are easy or good, easy to understand are not that um, uh, good to use when you are targeting children. So out of our studies, we found that um, a very explicit wording like paid advertising um, is more effective than vague wording. Um, but we, we also had discussions with the, with the Dutch Media Authority. And of course, we have the in Europe, we have the media laws that make a distinction between advertising and product placement and sponsoring. Um, and uh, sometimes we also got back from a legal perspective. Yeah, but if we call something advertising where legally it is product placement or it's sponsorship, then we are not saying the right thing. But from a consumer perspective and uh, as a researcher that really um, was interested in the consumer perspective, in the children's perspective, what do they understand? We would say and advise these legal distinctions between paid, sponsored, brand placement, whatever it's called, are not important for children. They understand what advertising is uh, from a certain age. Uh, and if you can tell them that, then it can it, it can really uh, help uh, increase the transparency of commercial content online. Uh, some things that uh, our research showed that are not good, that are not understandable for children, is, for example, sponsored by. Uh, we asked children about their associations and they said, yeah, well, sponsored sounds like a charity or like a support. So when I do a charity run for school, I'm also sponsored by my parents and, and my neighbors. They give me money. So that's actually a good thing if a brand sponsors um, an influencer. So that's a total, totally different association. It can, of course, be a good thing, but that's not what we want to uh, make clear when we're using disclosures of sponsored content. We want to uh, um, make children understand that there's an ulterior motive and that there's um uh, the the intent to persuade them to make that make them change their behavior or thoughts so sponsored by science sounds too um too much like support also uh often you see uh this is in collaboration with um and that was also very confusing for children because they said, yeah, also in school, I collaborate with other kids and we help each other. So if a brand is collaborating with an influencer or with a game producer or even with an artist, they see that as a, a mutual uh, relationship, also a, um, um, an equal relationship where they help each other out. And uh, yeah, of course, you could argue as an adult to a certain extent, extent that's true, but that's, of course, not what we want to uh, make the children aware of, that they have to be critical, that they are being advertised to, that that the advertiser wants to sell uh, products. Um, so then also collaboration sounds too, um, yeah, too innocent, uh, maybe. Then, so after opportunity, ability, uh, there's also a very important aspect, and that's motivation. And, and that's a, an issue for, I think, for many vulnerable groups, uh, but also uh, for children. Um, if they are not motivated to find out what the content is that they are watching, if they are not motivated to be critical, we can inform them as much as we want, and we can inform them uh, in in the best, but to their fitting their abilities and giving them all their all the opportunities, but there also has to be some motivation to to know uh, what to do or or where to look. 
So um, I think it's really uh, how can we increase that motivation among vulnerable people, uh, vulnerable children, minors. First of all, I think it's very important to create awareness of sponsoring online, of sponsored content online. If you do not know that it exists, you're also not motivated to, to deal with it or to deal with it critically or to, to look for extra information or to doubt your own decisions that you make based on this content. So you first, you have to be aware. And I think um, one of the ways to do that is not only by using disclosures, but also by um, having education and uh, um, literacy programs. So make children aware of the level of uh, commercializedness of, of the content online that they are seeing. Um, so they have to know that it's not just free content, but that, that there's a whole commercial and economic system behind all this nice content that they are seeing. And also important to enhance motivation is to explain the consequences. So also when we talk to children, but also to teenagers, they say, yeah, but yeah, it's not important. I don't really care. And also you see the same um, attitude when you talk about the privacy, for example. Like, yeah, I have nothing to hide. Uh, and children also say, yeah, with this advertising, yeah, I don't care. I decide for myself which product I buy or I'm not uh, persuaded, but others are. For me, it doesn't matter. But if they realize that there are consequences to being persuaded by content that was not as honest or unbiased as you as you thought it was, um, they might have also have more motivation to um to be aware. So really personal consequences for them that they might spend their pocket money on products that uh, are not uh, as good as was, as was promised by an influencer or that they get in conflict with their parents because they keep asking and keep nagging for the products that they see online because they think that's something you, all kids need to have uh, and, and they don't realize that it's just because the advertisers plugged it um, and then also uh, for the motivation to enhance, I think it's very important not just to inform them and to make it clear that it's advertising, but also to help them to be critical. And with being critical, I don't mean that they have to resist. Um, so it's not that we want to stop persuasion because there's also, of course, persuasion for good things. Uh, and advertising can help inform people, also children, about what's out there. Um, and of course, it can also be about, about food or about uh, pro-social behavior. So I think the most important thing is to help children to be critical. Uh, so to help them uh, develop their ability to stop and think when they see entertaining, um, uh, grabbing, um, um, involving content online. So they have to learn not to be uh, swayed by everything that they see, but they have to realize, okay, when I'm watching this, I might get excited and I might think, oh, my, 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 my hero is doing this. I want this. No, first stop and think, why am I feeling this way? Why do I want this product? And that's, of course, a hard thing to learn. And also some adults find it hard to learn. But there are techniques um, uh, that also my colleague Esther Rosendahl is using with children, uh, for also based on meditation and mindfulness that can help children uh, to start to just pause and stop and think before they um, are persuaded. And that also an increases their motivation to become a critical uh, uh, consumer. So after uh, the motivation, opportunity, and ability, um, I think it's also good to, to talk about the consequences. So what if we have the perfect, uh, created the perfect situation, this perfect uh, opportunity for a, ch a child to see it, to uh, that it fits their abilities, and we can get them motivated to, to, to process or to, to pay attention, then what can the consequences of disclosures be? Well, uh, our research file found, um, luckily, that disclosures can enhance children's persuasion knowledge. So that's what they're there for. They are there to increase transparency and to help children understand that something is persuasion knowledge, uh, that something is persuasion. So 
Uh, persuasion knowledge is, of course, a little bit of jargon. It's a, it's a term that we use in, in literature, and you can imagine what it means, but maybe it's good to, um, um, to break it down in a more specific aspect. So there are several aspects to persuasion knowledge, and that also is good if to take into account as a um, if you want to protect consumers or if you are a legislator what do i want to accomplish accomplish with uh, the disclosures that i'm using for example do i want a vulnerable group or children in this case to recognize that something is advertising so to take the example again of influencer marketing do I want the child to know that they are being advertised at one of their consumer rights? Or maybe do I also want to take it a little bit further and do I want them to understand that the content has a persuasive intent? Um, and um, as adults, these two are often very strongly connected. So if you know that something is advertising, you also immediately know or think, okay, this is then created to persuade me. They want me to buy this product or they want me to think think positively about this company. But what we see in research among children is that these two develop at different stages in different at different ages, uh, developmental stages. Uh, so first children can understand that something is advertising, but I was also surprised to learn, and when I really talk to children, that that doesn't automatically mean that they understand that the advertising wants to sell them something. That understanding develops later and is also not automatically triggered if they know that something is advertising. Um, and why is it important to know that uh, uh, online content has a persuasive intent? Because then you can also think of the consequences for you. It's it's something uh, the content wants you to, to, to be persuaded. You are a target. It wants to change your behavior, your thoughts. Uh, and only if you realize that, you can act on that. And you can decide that it's okay because it's a valuable source or because it's credible information. But you could also uh, be critical and resist because you don't, don't trust it or don't want to be persuaded. So these are two different things. We and we in the literature we also see there's a, uh, another aspect that is a knowledge about the tactics that are used. So do we want children to understand that, for example, sponsored content is hiding the persuasive intent because it's presented as entertainment or as an influencer telling about a product and not an advertiser saying it? Uh, although it's disclosed, it's still often hidden, or that it wants to create positive association. Also, if you think of uh, for, uh, movies like uh, James Bond and all these brands that are sponsoring the movie, they want to create these positive associations around their brand. So do we also want to learn and teach children that? And I have to say the research that we've done on the consequences of disclosures mainly focused on the first two aspects. So can they help children recognize advertising and can they help raise their uh, understanding of persuasive intent? And um, if they are um, well designed and adhere to these principles of opportunities and abilities, uh, we see that they can disclosures can effectively inform uh, minors. Uh, another thing also to realize or take into account that um, uh, persuasion knowledge can also uh, consist of the people's understanding of persuasion effects. So understand that it affects my uh, my buying behavior or uh, that it affects someone else's cognitions. So the persuasive intent is that it has that intent, but persuasion effects is more about do I realize that it also has that effect on me? And finally, also, especially for education, it's important to also teach children something about the economic model behind sponsored content and about online content in general, like um, no content is really free. You pay with your data or you pay with your attention. Um, so it's it's good for, for children, for, for all vulnerable groups or, or for basically for everyone to understand the economic model behind these forms of communications. Because only if you understand that, you are really empowered to deal with it critically. So that's uh, the transparency part. So can disclosures enhance transparency? That's what they're there for. But then... 
also very often get the question, yeah, but what does it do per, for persuasion? And especially when you're dealing with lobbyists, if you're dealing with advertisers or uh, content creators, sometimes they are hesitant to uh, implement these disclosures, um, although uh, it, it, it's legally um, uh, um, obliged. Sometimes there's some hesitation. And what we see in the literature is that there are mixed effects for children. So some studies show that disclosures lead to less persuasion because children become more critical, uh, whereas other studies show that there's no effects or even more persuasion. Um, and I would like to go into three uh, explanations for the mixed findings. So why is it sometimes that children become more critical, sometimes even more persuaded, or we see no effects? Well, first of all, um, an explanation for the mixed findings of disclosures of transparency about sponsored content on persuasion is parasocial relationships. So parasocial relationships are relationships that you build with the characters or the people that you see in media so it's not really social relationships because it's not uh, although online it's more and more interactive but it's not really your friend but you get the impression that it's a friend uh, because you see so much of that person um, and what we see for in particular for influencers is that if children have a very strong bond with an influencer, if they feel like it's their friend, they have a parasocial relationship, their information knowledge can be increased by disclosure, so it enhances transparency. But we also see that they do not become more negative about the brand. Um, so because they think still think it's a friend of me, of mine, and they are, uh, although I know they are advertising, I still want that because it feels like this person is my friend. So then the motivation to become critical is lower. Another thing um, that we found in several studies is um, maybe also counterintuitive, is that persuasion can also increase if you um, disclose that something is advertising. So some uh, advertisers are hesitant. They say, yeah, well, if people know that it's advertising, then I better do it myself, then it's not effective anymore. Um, but we also see that uh, uh, the transparency of sponsorship is uh, appreciated. And also t children and teenagers say that, yeah, I, I actually am favorable of this brand because they support my favorite influencer or my favorite artist. Also, so we did this for uh, musicians. They make it possible that they can create this great clip or this song or that they can create this content. So that leads to positive um, evaluations of, uh, of sponsors. So, so far about uh, disclosures of uh, sponsored content online. And now I'd like to briefly um, also say something about uh, gamification. Um, so... Um, together with two colleagues of mine, Seb von Berlo and Martin Eisend, we conducted a meta-analysis, and that's um, uh, an analysis of all the existing studies on advert games at that moment. And I think this was published uh, around three to four years ago. So we uh, checked all the literature and we synthesized this literature to, to be able to draw conclusions on the effects of gamification in advertising. And we only included studies that explicitly compared advert games, so games that are created by advertisers in which the brand is featured, uh, to other forms of advertising. So the difference between a commercial and an advert game or a banner and an advert game. Um, so different advertising formats and to see whether gamification is effective. And in this meta-analysis, we found that advert games lead to more positive evaluations of the advertising message compared to other advertising formats. So advert games are better liked as a form of advertising than um, commercials, for example. And you can, yeah, you can imagine why, because it's of course fun to play a game, especially if it's a nice game. So that also transmits to the evaluation of the advertising. We also saw that if brands are integrated, they are less remembered when they are in an advert game. So other forms of advertising lead to more brand memory. 
And that's due to the cognitive capacity that it takes to play a game. Uh, so that leaves less capacity to remember the brand. We also saw that advert games are more persuasive than other forms of advertising. So they are an effective way to influence people. Uh, it leads to more positive attitudes. It leads to more behavioral intentions towards the brands or the <clears throat> messages integrated in these games than to other forms of advertising. Also increases choice behavior. So if people have to pick a product, they're more likely to pick the product that they saw in an advert game than if they saw it in a, in a commercial. <clears throat> but, and that's also important for transparency, advert games are less likely to be recognized as advertising. So it's more of a hidden form of advertising, which poses a threat to um, children's independence and their uh, autonomy as a consumer, because if they are not aware that what they are playing, playing with is advertising, it's harder for them to be critical. And also an important finding is that we, in all these studies, different age, gr age groups were uh, included. Uh, some studies were done among adults, some among children. And we found that younger children are more susceptible to effects. So that means that children are more persuaded by advert games than, um, than older children or even adults. Um, so they are less critical and they're more uh, vulnerable. And another interesting finding that we did in the, that we found that we uh, found out in a study that also I conducted with, uh, conducted with Seb von Berlo is that uh, teenagers who were more attached to their smartphones and if they played advert games on their smartphones, they showed more persuasion knowledge regarding these advert games. So. Um, that would mean that if you use your phone more, you are also better able to recognize it and also to, um, uh, yeah, um, you are less likely to be tricked by, by these games. So it's also the experience with, and we also see that in other studies, the experience with the medium that helps you um, in understanding what's going on. And that's also uh, an issue if you think about um, uh, banning advertising, for example, uh, or banning use of certain media, you also need that experience to be able to uh, to recognize what's going on, on, on in these media and in this, uh, on these platforms. So uh, I think time's also uh, almost up. So uh, I want to wrap up and a conclusion, I'm just shortly repeating what I, what I talked about. For effective sponsorship disclosure for children, for minors, how to empower them and increase transparency. It's very important to take their opportunity into account, the opportunity to see and to process the information that you're giving them. It's important to take their abilities into account, uh, for example, by using wording that they understand and that's uh, clear to them. We have to uh, also work on their motivation to be able to uh, effectively uh, inform them and to help them become critical consumers and to make informed decisions. And uh, as a conclusion, I would also say that persuasion through gamification is not very transparent because it's not recognized as being advertising, but it is effective. And that's also, of course, good to know um, when thinking about protecting um, vulnerable groups. So that was it for me. And um, I would like to hear your questions uh, after the presentations. I'd like to answer them. Thank you so much, Eva. Uh, I think this was really interesting and I'm sure very useful for all of us who are working uh, to protect children in the online environment. Again, for the audience, uh, please save your questions for the Q&A session, which we will have later on. Because now it's time to introduce our second speaker. Um, it's my colleague, Cecilia Norlander, who is a senior legal officer specialized in marketing directed to children at the Swedish Consumer Agency. Uh, Cecilia will speak about how we can take this important research on, for example, children's advertising literacy to make the enforcement even more effective. So please, Cecilia, the floor is yours. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Amy, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Eva, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we are so grateful for the work you and your colleagues are doing to, uh, to shine light on this very important issue. Um, and I'm very happy for the opportunity to give a short update today on the work that the Swedish Consumer Agency is doing uh, to try to make a step to better integrate research into um, the work of our authority um, with the aim to make the enforcement more effective and the everyday life easier for the child consumer. Um, so next slide, please. Children are, as you all know, daily exposed to large amounts of advertising and uh, at the same time, uh, as we have learned now, children's mental skills and abilities are still developing, meaning that they have much more difficulties consciously and critically coping with advertising than adults. And moreover, in the past decades, we have seen a rapidly evolving media landscape in which advertising is much more subtle uh, and embedded, making it even more difficult for children to recognize advertising as such. Um, and as we see in this example of here today, a growing body of research has emerged concerning children's advertising literacy, um, and that's the knowledge, abilities, and attitudes that may help them cope with this advertising. Uh, and as an enforcement authority, we have a responsibility to use our resources as efficiently as possible, and therefore we need to prioritize issues that are of general interest and to take action where it will lead to the most consumer welfare. Next slide, please. So the research shows that advertising literacy gradually increases with age and that it develops from simple to more sophisticated knowledge and beliefs about the nature of advertising and uh, its persuas uh, persuasive intent. Uh, and as the development of advertising literacy depends on children's uh, cognitive abilities, including children's ability to acquire, encode, organize and retrieve information. And what this tells us is that it's not it's, it's important not to lump children together into broad categories and to avoid one size fits all measures. Um, and the more recent studies on children's advertising literacy also focuses on contemporary advertising formats such as brand placement and in entertainment media and influencer marketing. And these studies shows that in comparison with the more classic television commercials, children of all ages now find it far more difficult to recognize these more contemporary advertising formats as a form of persuasion. Uh, and as we've heard, an explanation to this, of course, is that these forms of advertising are highly integrated into uh, editorial content uh, or entertainment. And as a result, there are fewer identifiable commercial characteristics uh, and consequently, children find it more difficult to recognize these forms of advertising. And if children don't recognize the contemporary advertising messages as such, it's far more difficult for them to understand the commercial nature of those messages. So recognizing commercial intent is crucial to activate the advertising literacy and enable children to critically reflect on the commercial content. Uh, and how they must be aided to do so. So for instance, by an uh, effective advertising disclosure. Uh, one way to empower children as critical consumers of advertising is by increasing their critical thinking skills and coping mechanisms through advertising literacy training, for example, through educational programs in schools. And studies show that such advertising literacy training programs can be effective in enhancing children's understanding of advertising, understanding of selling intent, understanding of persuasive tactics, and awareness of the commercial source of, for example, advert games. And we know that knowledge may not be enough to increase their advertising literacy. Children also need to be stimulated and motivated to activate and use their advertising um, literacy. And Parents could play an important role in this respect. With active mediation, parents can enhance the child's uh, advertising defenses by triggering them to think about the nature of advertising messages and be more critical towards them. Next slide, please. So how do we use this knowledge uh, in practice? Well, first, research can help us to prioritize which areas and cases to focus on to ensure that our work will lead to the most consumer welfare. The need 
of a trigger to activate advertising literacy is reflected in practice by advertising disclosures. So the most important condition of an advertising disclosure is that it triggers advertising recognition. If children do not recognize the commercial intent, then they are unlikely to activate their advertising literacy. And the Swedish Consumer Agency has been prioritizing influence and marketing for several years now. And as a part of the European Consumer Protection Cooperation Network, we have uh, been contributing to developing a common understanding on disclosures of commercial uh, content. content. Uh, influence, and, influence and marketing is alongside other similar commercial practices like in-app purchases and gaming, specifically problematic for children because of the use of embedded uh, and subtle uh, advertising. And certain advertising formats and techniques will also be using powerful emotional appeals, even distract children from using relevant advertising knowledge as a critical defense. And uh, the CPC network has produced a guidance document on five key principles on how to disclose commercial content on social media. And the guidance highlights principles that should be considered when designing an ad label, for example, behavioral insights on how consumer perceives certain features and specific vulnerabilities of children. We believe that uh, an essential part of integrating research into everyday operations is to raise knowledge and awareness internally. And we have, for example, educated the legal officers in advertising literacy and children's vulnerability to advertising. We are also producing procedural documents to facilitate the use of evidence-based enforcement. Our agency is connected to a scientific council consisting of researchers in various areas like law, risk management, consumer psychology, and computer science, with the purpose of making it easier for us to access recent research and also to contribute to our work with their knowledge and expertise. We have a child and youth network at our agency to help monitoring new reports and studies and spreading knowledge and experience internally and helping us to keep the child's perspective in planning and prioritizing. And finally, knowing that advertising literacy training programs can be effective in enhancing children's understanding uh, of, for example, different persuasive tactics. Our agency supports teachers by providing them with material and are a strong advocate for children's right to basic consumer education in school. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, I'm very glad that our agency has understood the importance of taking research into account in, in our work. Um, we're running out of time here, uh, but it's not because of you as speakers, it's because we started a bit late here. But let's move on to our third speaker. It's uh, Antonio Mancini, who is a senior expert at the Directorate for International and EU Affairs at the Italian Competition Authority. Antonio will share experiences from his authority regarding manipulative practices targeting digital vulnerable consumers. And I also believe that we will learn a bit more about their very recent case against TikTok. Please, Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emiva, very much for the floor and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to try to share with you concrete enforcement experience of our uh, authority, you know, that we are very active in so many sectors. Uh, in uh, I tried to make a selection of some relevant, more general cases, also with more international relevance about big players. And I focus the attention more on social media sector and on uh, online game sector, which is very delicate sector. Uh, Maybe I, I have a problem about uh, the sharing. Okay, now I think it works like this. Okay, um, about uh, the uh, test on vulnerable consumer. First of all, uh, we must pay uh, very much attention on the evolution of business model because we have discovered and also the colleagues uh, coming from uh, university scientific research as concrete confirmation that the business model sometimes uh, is based just on targets of vulnerable consumer to develop new kind of online dark patterns. And so we must pay a special attention and create to make a difference between the most traditional uh, 
uh, normal uh, online dark patterns and new kind of dark patterns which need maybe additional attention. So there is a big also regulatory interest on developing new technique to discover this kind of new uh, dark patterns. But from our experience, the UCPD discipline, the unfair commercial practice discipline coming from the European legislation remains a benchmark. And I will give you a concrete example in which we have been able to close very big and relevant investigation just using the UCPD discipline, starting from professional diligence, misleading or omissive practice, aggressive practice, and so on. For example, point seven of the UCPD is just focused on dark patterns about pressure selling or scarcity claims. So the absolute priority for an efficient, competent authority is first of all, to try to give concrete answer to protect vulnerable consumer and to try to disseminate uh, not only big fines to try to stop this practice, but even to, to give some elements of evaluation about professional diligence standard, or even try to obtain from trader sites relevant commitments in order to uh, provide concrete uh, tools of protection of vulnerable consumer. Now, just some cases that we closed very recently. Maybe the most important, uh, very recent uh, case that we closed about uh, social media and protection of children as particular category of vulnerable consumer is the TikTok French scar case. It is a case uh, which stressed the special liability of TikTok uh, platform especially uh, about this dangerous challenge, which attract a lot uh, consumer. And uh, we stressed the point that there is the need to provide a concrete additional obligation for the traders. Uh, I try to simplify the concept and to go directly to the legal basis that we use it to close this case with a 10 million euro fines against TikTok. So we imposed this big level of fines, one of the highest level of fines that we have to try to tackle unfair commercial practices. And we consider this practice both misleading and aggressive. So misleading, uh, first of all, because uh, TikTok presented in its own guidelines, communicated to users through its websites, the uh, platform as safe platforms. So giving the idea that it would be able to prevent this kind of dangerous challenge. So there was also the violation of the professional diligence standard of the platform. And there was uh, the dissemination of dangerous content which were not prevented. But maybe the most interesting uh, perspective that we stressed is the existence also of an aggressive practice based on undue conditioning on uh, vulnerable consumers. So basing on the algorithmic user profiling related to the function for you and follow it, which stressed the selection of some video, just trying to give a commercial exploitation of the vulnerability of particular category of consumer. And we uh, mentioned in this decision, our past decision against Facebook, confirmed also by the administrative judges about the so call it the zero price and fair commercial price. So without also monetary transaction, there still exists a commercial transaction. We closed uh, this casing even uh, consulting uh, during a hearing, a specialized Italian expert in neuroscience for children, which confirmed the particular negative effects of this kind of practice. And we tried even to develop a legal evaluation about the relationship between the horizontal discipline about unfair commercial practice and some sectorial disciplines, for example, the Digital Service Act. And we stress the point that even using the general discipline about unfair commercial practice, there is still possibility to deal about these important cases of uh, con consumer protection as vulnerable consumer and especially uh, protection of children. Uh, a few weeks ago, in February, we closed another big investigation in uh, 
it was against the producer of a particular kind of food, not a normal food, a normal, for example, space snack, but a food named hot chip challenge, which was a food artificially created just to develop once again a very dangerous challenge for uh, consumer. In this case, we closed it with commitments, uh, this uh, investigation, because uh, the uh, producer decided to stop from its sale list completely um, this dangerous product. And so we closed it with commitment this case. So this was uh, just, I selected some cases very recent, uh, the past two months uh, of our decision in social media sector and particularly uh, practices targeted on online vulnerable consumer and namely uh, children. Let's move on online gaming, another very delicate sector uh, for which there is the need to protect vulnerable consumer and especially children. Even in this case, we have noted, of course, an evolution of the business model. Now, the model is the in-game purchases. And so there is the need to develop new investigation and enforcement technique. One of the uh, main attention of the Italian consumer protection in this past decision was based on the so-called loot boxes. This is an example of loot boxes. They are special items which give the possibility for a um, consumer to have additional uh, functionality, characteristic, and so on, you know. And they attract a lot of children uh, with uh, sound, music, description, and create the need to pay attention on the protection of uh, children as vulnerable consumer. And so I will give you a concrete example of investigation that we closed against the main two operators. You know that even actually uh, this investigation was closed a few years ago, but they still are the main player uh, on the online gaming industry, namely our Electronic Arts and Activision Blizzard, two big uh, multinational operators. For example, I can mention some games which are still popular, FIFA and Hearthstone. We closed this investigation with commitment, but we started with uh, a very wide uh, evaluation about potential violation of the UCPD um, discipline, starting from the professional diligence standard, misleading information about false free claim, loot boxes and I, we have seen which is loot boxes and the use of loot, bo loot boxes in this kind of games and also the absence of tools to try to uh, prevent some kind of unfair commercial practice and namely for example, the absolute absence at this time of the parental control function, which now are considered very crucial and essential. Let's uh, have a look to the kind of commitments that have been submitted by the traders involved in this too big investigation of the Italian Competition Authority and why we accepted at that time this kind of commitments, which still work and uh, have uh, something which have created even a more general effects even for other consumer. First of all, uh, now is less common to see indication about free function because uh, sometimes only the download is free, but the in-game purchases uh, need to use some uh, economic uh, involvement. So uh, first of all, uh, the commitments were based on the need to avoid the tool, any kind of false free claim. So there was, first of all, a commitment to avoid for the future this kind of free uh, claim indication. Then there was uh, the need to explain the function and the characteristic at the time not very known about the loot boxes uh, and these special tools. And finally, uh, what I mentioned before, the so-called parental control tool. More in details, the parental control function that we considered at the time in relevant commitments was based on the possibility to, for example, to put a monthly spending limit 
for children, you know, that uh, when you register online in online gaming activity, a credit card, of course, children can use this uh, platform to buy additional items. Using these parental control tools, parents can try to set at least a limit and through the creating of an account for children through a hyperlink, they could have access to these parental control features. And so once again, it was an interesting tool for us, uh, giving evidence about this kind of commitments. I try to accelerate a little bit because we have so many cases, but uh, I will try to make a selection and pass some final conclusion about the need for an efficient agency to give concrete tool of consumer protection, focusing, for example, in some area and some kind of vulnerable consumer, like, for example, uh, in this uh, hypothesis, uh, children. Another, uh, two other delicate investigation, always in the uh, online gaming sector, what's about the multiplayer function. You know that with online games, you have the possibility to uh, engage uh, other online, even abroad, even in other countries, everywhere in the world, they're connected on internet, they can engage on uh, an online gaming. We closed a big investigation against Microsoft, you know, is the market leader for the Xbox and Sony, which is the market leader, leader for PlayStation. And in this investigation, we examined also the same package of uh, Xbox and PlayStation. And we asked it to change also the box, because the box, uh, the, the product box is considered equivalent to a sort of advertising. And in these cases, we closed it. One investigation with fine and another investigation, once again, with the relevant big more general commitments. Uh, in the package, for example, it was not stressed the point that we use the multiplayer function, you need to close a subscription contract, which give also an obligation to a periodical fee. You need to pay to enjoy the multiplayer function tool. And so it's something which was not clarified in the advertising and in the same package of the product. In fact, uh, we finally uh, closed it. I mentioned it. one investigation with commitments and the other one was clothed with a fine uh, because of course they accepted, the traders accepted to change the packaging uh, just to simplify and to give directly to the conclusion that we uh, obtained in these two big investigation. We find Sony with a million, uh, with a fine of 2 million uh, and uh, additional obligation. We find uh, also the other traders, but first of all, we set the obligation to change in a certain time all the uh, product uh, box uh, uh, play uh, sold in the Italian market. Of course, we protect, first of all, Italian consumer, but very often our investigation involving such big multiplayer uh, traders have also more general, through the CPC or other tool, have also more general effect. In these cases, uh, they uh, accepted the obligation to change the package of uh, both the console, Xbox and PlayStation at the was time was the PlayStation 4, giving evidence about the need to close a subscription contract for online multiplayer function. So they eliminate completely the indication uh, free or something you can enjoy multiplayer function without specifying that you need to close a subscription uh, contract with the monthly fee. So some relevant effects. Uh, and so um, taking into consideration this uh, big investigation that we used uh, in social media and in uh, the online gaming sector, I try to give some uh, conclusion because I know that the time is running. So uh, I want to pass some concrete concept. 
For uh, the evolution of business model that I mentioned, I mentioned just two areas of uh, evolution of business model, there is the big challenge for an efficient, competent authority to protect vulnerable consumer and to give concrete answer to develop new investigation and enforcement technique. So one of the main points that uh, very often uh, I share with colleagues from CBC, for example, to say, which is the legal base that I can use to tackle these? There are new kinds of uh, uh, dark commercial patterns, so I must use the Digital Service Act or another legislation. From our experience, we still continue to use a lot which has defined the milestone in consumer protection, which still remain the European legislation about unfair commercial practice with that with the good and wide interpretation and enforcement still remain a benchmark for a very wide and concrete protection of consumer. And our investigation very often are confirmed also by the administrative judge. We have a full administrative competence. We have big investigation and enforcement powers. We don't have fear to start investigation about against the big multinational company. We have a big reputation from this point of view. So usually they appoint Italian lawyer and we don't have very much jurisdiction problems. And we try to give concrete example of administrative enforcement decision to try to uh, give concrete protection of vulnerable. And we still use the um, UCPD, but which is the problem of UCPD sometimes that even us uh, are facing, especially in the last year. The relationship between this horizontal legislation about unfair commercial practice and some sectorial, uh, sectorial regulation, namely Digital Service Act, Digital Market Act, Artificial Intelligence Act, Data Protection Act, Digital Content Direct, and so on. Very often, there is the need to clarify the possibility to apply in parallel this to a big uh, set of legal evaluation. And very often the general uh, tool that we can use under the unfair commercial practice directive helps us a lot to give a wide and concrete protection. But of course, even the Italian consumer code, you know that in Italy we have a consumer code, which is a collection of the most relevant legislation on consumer protection. So could be considered even a good example of best uh, legislation practice. In this consumer code is clarified that our authority, the Italian Competition and Consumer Protection Authority, has general horizontal competition in all economic sector, including the regulated one. When there is the need to deal about the regulatory sector, we try to develop cooperation with regulatory authority, asking them a non-binding opinion. So in, our, in my opinion, it's a good opportunity to try to share this experience, but to try to avoid too much uh, overlapping of intervention and to give a more general protection for consumer protection. So in conclusion, I want to stress that the unfair commercial practices still remain together with consumer right directive and unfair contra terms directive, the majority of our decision, and we still close a lot of big investigation in this area to try to protect uh, consumer, especially vulnerable consumer, uh, like uh, the adolescent that I mentioned. Thank you for your attention. I don't know. And I, I think there is space for some question. I try to be more or less in time and to speed up how much <laughs> that I can do. Very much. Thank you, Antonio, uh, both for the presentation and for keeping the time. Um, I think it's very interesting to hear about all your work. Uh, and in particular, the TikTok case, uh, the TikTok case, I think it's yet another action which shows the strength and also the courage uh, of your authority. I'm also very glad to hear your view about the usefulness of the unfair commercial practices directive. I fully share your position there. But it's time to uh, kick off our Q&A session. Uh, I don't think that we have any questions in the chat yet. I uh, also got confirmation from Valentina that we can go on until 3.45 to uh, give the audience um, enough time to ask the questions you would like to ask. So no 
uh, questions in the chat yet, and I can't see any hands up either. Christine, do you want to start asking some questions? Um, I think that's going to be a, a challenge um, to ask me to ask questions. I was um, very um, re reflecting on a how we managed to get an Italian speaker to finish on time. <laughs> um, but questions, there's obviously a thousands. I think vulnerable consumers is a very tricky concept. Um, and we, we focus very much on children, but I, I perhaps um, would, would, would ask the speakers perhaps to elaborate and open that up. So, so um, perhaps Eva, uh, you, you kind of very briefly mentioned it in your presentation. Um, I wondered if you could perhaps tell us a little bit more. I know you focus on children, but how do you see what you found with regards to children actually apply to other vulnerable groups? So, for example, the elderly. <laughs> Do they not share yeah. some characteristics that make yeah. the, the research actually relevant as well? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for that question. Indeed, I was hinting towards that during my presentation already a bit, uh, that it's uh, broader applicable than just to children. So I have to emphasize that the studies that we did were among children. But um, indeed, there are, I think there are some commu communalities between uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, also with regarding to their processing abilities. Um, and you can also think of, of elder people also having difficulties with uh, really fast paced content and uh, also need a little bit more time to process or to read uh, certain, uh, certain texts. Um, and also if you think uh, uh, of people with um, uh, lower levels of education, uh, less reading abilities, uh, they are also vulnerable in the sense that that it's harder to um, to inform them with with the th with the text that we may be, may be using now, and also then for their specific abilities, um, uh, we we need to keep them in mind, and also their motivations or or people that are are uh, um, yeah are in debt or have great stress or have uh, have uh, other mental issues. Um, yeah, what are their motivations to uh, to be critical when they're using media? They have more pressing problems on their minds, but th there's I think we also need to motivate them and make clear to them what the risks are and how they can uh, how their media use can increase their problems. Uh, because of their buying uh, behavior or because of the content that they're seeing that makes them feel worse. So um, I indeed think this, the, 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 the general principles that I discussed today apply to other vulnerable groups as well. Thank you. I have a question as well. Uh, if I may ask uh, Antonio, uh, I am particularly interested in your assessment of TikTok's recommendation system uh, based on algorithmic profiling, uh, which you found to be aggressive. Could you tell us a bit more about that assessment and how you found that that uh, system were exploiting uh, uh, the vulnerability of, uh, um, of certain consumers? Yes. <clears throat> Yes, in this case, we considered uh, an aggressive practice of TikTok as a sort of undue influence because, you know, we moved from the this famous challenge, you know, the French SCAR challenge, which is based on uh, the um, video which shows some sign on uh, on phase and can be very uh, dangerous for children. And so we discovered that uh, although in its uh, guidelines, uh, TikTok indicated that they would try to prevent uh, from the beginning on a, at least to eliminate uh, this dangerous content. In reality, these uh, content were um, just um, devoted, especially to children that even in the past interaction showed, for, in, for, in, for, for example, some um, interest in autolesionism or in some kind of vulnerability. So the algorithm, uh, I, of course, we couldn't uh, add uh, details about 
the way they construct. But we have evidence uh, from the experience uh, because there was an alert from the Italian postal service which showed this challenge is becoming very, very popular in uh, in Italy coming uh, from the experience. And it's becoming and reported even the case of children which exploit this. And uh, we organized also a down raids, you know, you mentioned that we are very brave, very courageous. We organized also a down raids in TikTok Italy SRL, which is, we discovered that in Milan, they had a small office and we checked some emails and we get additional evidence about this, about the exploitation, because you know that the business model of TikTok is uh, related to interaction. So the more they have interaction of children, so the more there is download of this video, the more the people stay and spend time on this kind of this dangerous challenge, autolationism or something which can trick their security, the more they earn, because of course it's part of their business model. So stressing for me, for, for this, we consider it. I am interesting, Emmy, and I pose to you and Cecilia a question because we consulted an external Italian uh, expert, a professor uh, in uh, was, was um, a professor uh, that has big experience about uh, children as a vulnerable consumer, uh, about uh, uh, effects uh, on uh, this kind of disease and vulnerabilities, but. I, uh, I noted that you have uh, a sort of, of um, scientific committee uh, that you have. I want to clarify, but it's uh, organized uh, with external experts. They are not employee of the Swedish agency, if I am not wrong. They are external uh, experts, which you usually consult with different specialization in uh, in different sectors. Just, just something about this uh, scientific committee because it's interesting for us. Yes, uh, it's correct. It's not employees of the agency. It's uh, professors and researchers from different universities in Sweden who are um, appointed to this scientific council, um, which is hosted by uh, our organization. So we use them for different purposes. We can consult them on specific issues. Uh, they could help us to learn more about different studies um, and uh, we could also have an impact on you know what we would like researchers to focus on so it's really a win-win situation here I would say and we have really um, we have gotten a lot of help from them uh, on different area um, one example is that um, we have been focusing a lot of unauthorized transactions where elderly people have been subject mm. to um, payment frauds. So, and um, there is uh, difficulties in terms of legislation here because it seems to be um, a situation where you expect a lot from the consumer to be able to identify that this is a fraudster that is calling. Um, and uh, we got a statement from one of the professors in the scientific council, um, who is a professor in psychology, who made a statement for us explaining the psychology behind sometimes irrational and unlogical uh, financial decisions that are taking in these stressful situations, uh, which occurs when, when you are contacted by a fraudster. So this statement has been really useful for us. We've used them in different you know, consultations for new legislation and uh, in different areas. So um, the Scientific Council has been very helpful to us. Thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting. I will give you, ask you some additional, but maybe more in the CPC, we will share more in detail this because it's very interesting. We are developing something similar, but actually we are consulting external expert on individual request only for specific area, but maybe it's a good idea to have a sort of committee council to have more regularly relationship with this kind of external expert. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, we have some questions in the chat right now. We have questions from Eva. Um, I will I will uh, ask Cecilia Eva's question here. What do you think are the are the biggest challenges for the coming five years for your authority regarding children? Cecilia? Yes, yeah, I think it's a really good question. Uh, and I I think that of course we have a lot of challenges. I think that, like I said, that this is the first step of trying to make sure that we 
uh, learn a lot from science and research. I think that that will be a continuous a challenge to do so and to learn more. Uh, but I would say that the, one of the challenges are, of course, the prioritizing to to make sure that we focus on the right things. Uh, it's, it's so many things that we could do, and um, it's important for us to to know what kind of marketing or advertising that children need and how we can make sure that we do enough for them. So I think that would be perhaps the biggest challenge is, is actually prioritizing. I think it's the legal framework is actually there. Uh, it's um, we need to um, have the, um, to facilitate how we like use technology to find the advertising, but I think the legal framework are, are in place. Uh, but of course, like I said, prioritizing to do, to focus on the right things. I think that would be a challenge. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, we also have a question from Norway, from Erika uh, to Eva. Um, she is referring that you mentioned uh, children's age uh, as a factor for understanding advertisement. Um, so she is asking, is there a specific age uh, that um, is relevant here when it comes to understanding advertising? Yeah. Yeah, so um, there's not a short answer. <laughs> uh, so overall, children from the age of seven understand um, explicit advertising, like commercials or banners. Uh, they understand its intent. But for these um, embedded forms of advertising or sponsored content, it's uh, it really depends on the on the type of advertising and also on the experience that the child has with the advertising. And there's also a big difference in understanding it in theory so that you can say or um, explain that it exists, that it's out there, that, it, that you see it sometimes and understanding and recognizing specific instances or specific campaigns or specific posts as advertising. And that then also really depends on, on how uh, transparent it is, how um, overly persuasive, um, and uh, I sometimes even miss it, um, although I'm studying this phenomenon for a long time, and it, it is also a gray area, so sometimes it's really hard to find out whether something is advertising. So you have this general knowledge, your conceptions in your mind that, that whether you understand the phenomenon of advertising, but the totally different things and I think that's also what Cecilia was referring to in her presentation you also have to then apply it to specific content that you come across um, and that's much, that's much harder and, and that also varies a lot depending on um, your experiences the, the content the the situation are you depleted are you tired are you uh, alert uh, so yeah that's that's all I can say about it. Yeah. Thank you, Eva. Um, I also heard that there was a question from Biuk, uh, but I'm not able to see it. Valentina, can you read it out? Yes, of course, Amy. Thank you. Um, the question is directed to AGCM and is on uh, the recent decision against TikTok. And what is the relationship between between the AGCM decision on TikTok and the coordinated action of the CPC network about TikTok? Thank you very much, Stephen. <clears throat> it's it's uh, our investigation, of course, is a national investigation that. Uh, started from some evidence that we uh, collected at the national level. And so we decided to develop this big investigation. It's not the first time that Italy developed big investigation. I remember the investigation and the case that we closed against Google, Facebook, Amazon. Uh, I can mention so many, WhatsApp. So big uh, multinational uh, traders, uh, of course, giving evidence about national violation from our perspective. Uh, there is also for other kind of potential violation of unfair commercial practices, some uh, uh, reflection and investigation. In the past, we closed, for example, a big investigation against TikTok for unfair contra terms. And imagine that we closed in parallel 
this investigation because there was the coordinated action at CPC level and we closed also another national uh, enforcement activity with the same results in terms of uh, uh, commitments to change unfair contract terms. But of course, uh, it's not so easy sometimes to, co to combine a national investigation. We hope that uh, the coordinated action against the talk, uh, which has been mentioned, could have uh, further development. Of course, sometimes there is the need to enlarge the protection of vulnerable consumer, especially at European level. So of course, we are happy if this investigation will develop and uh, we will uh, give our small contribution. I see also another point that has been mentioned and is interesting, uh, but is, is Eva that mentioned this, uh, was the relationship between the Italian investigation and the American position against TikTok. Okay. As far as I know, the American position against TikTok is more a political and a more general position based on a first rule of the American parliament, based on the fact that there is the suspect that TikTok uh, hasn't uh, a safe use of data and can also eventually create problems uh, or manipulate the American election, share data, uh, share uh, fake uh, information. So there is a more general, it's, it's, for example, if we can make a comparison, it's not a decision issued from colleagues of, of Federal Trade Commission, it's more a political and governmental decision. So it's something completely uh, different. We in Italy are a technical competent enforcement authority and administrative authority without any kind of a political involvement. So we issued a political evaluation with the legal basis of the UCPD is completely different. This is a decision and sometimes there is a possibility even that in the United States will be completely blocked, you know, <laughs> this possibility. In Italy, we haven't blocked TikTok, actually. We haven't blocked uh, TikTok, we asked them we find it with 10 million, so we are happy that the uh, Italian treasury will uh, gain 10 million euro, <laughs> considering even the level of tax that they pay. It's also a pleasure for us <laughs> to give this contribution. You know, in Italy, that a part of our funds goes also to finance qualified project of a consumer association. So it's also a way to uh, promote the activity of consumer association. Happy for this, and we hope, of course, to give some signal to change these, uh, you know, that uh, there are uh, Italian lawyer appointed by TikTok uh, that we are working because we asked also to make report. We don't close the investigation and stop. We uh, issue also a cease and desist order and we ask a compliance report. So we will check <laughs> the compliance report that they will submit and if trying to, to discover that they change it something. It's not easy, of course, because uh, what Amy put, uh, how you evidence about they can change uh, the algorithm uh, profile to try to avoid exploitation, commercial exploitation or vulnerability, of course. It's not easy, but we try to uh, issue about this so complex and delicate problem about an aggressive practice. So thanks for the relationship with the American. Yeah, situation. thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Um, I don't think that we have time for any more questions now. I, I still have uh, 10,000 questions on my list that I would like to ask because I think it's been really interesting. Um, but um, I think it's time to wrap up uh, this webinar. We have already exceeded our time. So, Christine, do you want to start with some concluding remarks? Great. Thank, thank you. And thank you once again to all the speakers and, and to Emmy for organising this. It's been fascinating. Um, I always find, having done some research myself on vulnerable consumers, that they are often um, either the primary focus of researchers or something that is of no concern at all. Um, so it's it's very good to have been able to bring that to our forum and, and reflect a little bit more about how we can tackle unfair commercial practices directed at children, but also the wider vulnerable consumer group. Um, I certainly was um, impressed by um, the level of activity that is 
ongoing um, and, and the research that comes to inform it. Um, I'd like to remind our audience that uh, following this webinar and the last two that we had previously on AI, we are writing what we call technical notes, um, which are going to try and, and present um, the broad concepts that we discussed and, and give a starting point for researchers and, and, and authorities that may want to start tackling those problems. So if you are like Eva, um, a producer of excellent research, um, things that can inform our thinking and, and that you'd like to send to us to inform what we are going to write, please do so. Uh, send it via Valentina and Elizabeth, uh, whose email are on the website of UNCTAD under the um, um, working group on uh, consumer protection in e-commerce and we'll happily read what you've sent and, and, and include it if we can or if we think that fits. Uh, but I certainly will not be wasted because the more knowledge we have collectively, the better informed we are, we, the better we can actually protect consumers um, around the world. So I'd like to um, remind everyone of that. Um, I just have two comments, two things that were just super for me today to hear. Um, the first one was to hear about all the education that's been ongoing and how the research has been integrated obviously being an academic myself it's always music to my ear to hear that policymakers are listening um, and I'm sure Eva probably is uh, equally uh, as um rewarding to have your work recognized in that way. Um, but I think I had one reaction to this, which was, I am all in favor of literacy, but I always want to reemphasize the message that literacy is great, it's important, but it can never be at the cost of more effective norms to actually frame the protection of consumers. Far too long, I have found, being from Europe, we have used information as, as this kind of quick fix, saying, oh, yeah, inform them, they'll be fine. <laughs> um, and, and we have learned that it's not actually working like this. And, and for that, I think it's fantastic that um, enforcement authorities are getting involved, continuing to inform, but also taking action um, in the way that Italy has, has, uh, has explained. And I think from that, I have to say that, yes, the very bold and confident interpretation that the UCPD um, is, is actually inspiring. Um, I know that not all of our stakeholders, not all countries in the world have the same framework to work from, but certainly what they can take away from that is the fact that there are rules on the books and they can be flexible if we are willing to make them flex. And I think for that, um, the Italian experience is, is, is for me really sticks um, today in my mind. So um, thank you. And now what we really want to hear is what an enforcement agency makes of everything they've heard today. So Emmy, back to you and thank you very much for everyone. Uh, well, thank you. Um, well, I agree with you, Christine. It's been a really uh, fruitful workshop and we've learned a lot. And I think it's pretty clear that research academia plays a very important role to ensure a high consumer protection for vulnerable consumers on digital markets. Uh, I mean, if we as consumer protection authorities understand how consumers are affected by all of these complex commercial practices and how they understand different ad labels and so on, then we have a better chance to actually give um, or ensure a, a high protection. I think what I take with me is uh, Eva's presentation um, in terms of what is needed for children to identify commercial content. I mean, even that we're talking about different wordings are really, really useful for us because we constantly hear that um, from from, dif from different <laughs> stakeholders that, yes, but uh, this term is perfectly okay. Everyone understands what it is, but terms like cooperation or a partnership is very vague and it's very good to hear from researchers as well that, it's not sufficient for children. So I think that has, it's been very useful for us. And this is definitely something that I think uh, all consumer protection authorities should take into account in order to set the right bar for how clear and prominent ad labels must be. Um, I think Cecilia, my colleague also presented several different ways a consumer authority can make use of research um, in our enforcement work. And uh, finally, I think uh, Antonio also showed us how expertise regarding children's abilities could play a role in concrete actions as well, such as uh, the TikTok case. So I think it all played together really well here. And I will personally take a lot with me into our future work. 
So uh, I think with that said, um, I would like to thank our three speakers, Eva, Cecilia and Antonio, uh, also the ANCTA Secretariat uh, for the opportunity and particularly Valentina and Elizabeth. Um, and of course, Christine, thank you for keeping it all together and for <laughs> driving this project forward. So uh, thank you to everyone and thank you to all participants as well. Bye and thank you. Thank you very much.